Tú me dices, Mariana. Um, I think it's already there. Are you ready? Yes. Very good. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, conversation uh, from the Círculo Locraciano y Horror de México. Uh, my name is Gaby, and uh, today we are very, very happy uh, to have this uh, talk uh, with a very special guest all the way from uh, Denmark. He is joining us. Uh, it's 10 p.m. Uh, where he is at. Uh, Matthias Clayson. Uh, and uh, Matthias, he is uh, an English uh, literary and film scholar. Uh, he works as an associate professor uh, for the School of Communication and Culture in Aarhus uh, University. Um, he is also the director of the Recreational Fear Lab. Yes, Recreational Fear Lab. Uh, which is a research unit uh, dedicated to the scientific investigation of frightening leisure activities. Uh, his research has sparked a lot of interest in media. Uh, he has appeared in different occasions in Danish, Swedish, and uh, British uh, television and newspapers, and uh, I don't know if uh, in other uh, venues. He has his own TED Talk uh, from 2017, which is very recommended and you can find it easily in YouTube. And uh, he has been guest of numerous uh, podcasts, uh, among them Star Talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, finally, uh, he is the author of two amazing books about uh, horror. The first one from 2017 is uh, Why Horror Seduces, which you can find both in print and in uh, uh, Kindle. And uh, the latest one, A Very Nervous Person's Guide to Horror Movies from this year, which in words of Joe Hill, uh, and I quote, is the best, most insightful thing written about the horror genre in 40 years. Welcome, Matthias. Oh, thank you. Uh, that was a great introduction. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can live up to it. Um, uh, certainly, you, you saved me my first slide. Uh, because that's, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's fine. It's here. You know, I can just skip it. It's a real, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here and to be among uh, like-minded horror Lovecraft enthusiasts. So yes, like you said, I'm the director of something called the Recreational Fear Lab, which is a relatively new uh, research unit. Uh, and I've written a couple of books. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about today was um, scary entertainment and the psychology of scary entertainment and the ways in which you can um, research scary entertainment, uh, literature, uh, movies, video games, horror virtual reality, haunted houses, and so on. But I also wanna say something about why it's interesting to do research on that topic. And I wanna address, at least implicitly, some of the many, many, many misunderstandings and prejudices that cling to scary entertainment, uh, because horror has a reputation for being aesthetically uninteresting, psychologically harmful, and morally problematic. Uh, but really, that's not the case, and I'm going to, uh, to explain why I don't think that's the case. So um, before we get started, I want to get the shocks of horror into focus. And I thought a good way to do so would be to reference one of the all-time Hollywood horror movie classics, The Exorcist. Uh, because this is a film that either everybody has seen or they will have heard about it, unless they're you know, of a very young generation. Uh, one of the most famous horror movies of all time, based, of course, on a novel by the, of the same title. Uh, but what's interesting about The Exorcist is not just the movie itself, but its reception. So when that movie came out um, just after Christmas in 1973, people were terrified. Uh, and very quickly, the newspapers started carrying reports about people passing out from fear in the movie theaters, people vomiting from terror in the movie theaters. And in the US, ambulances were parked outside of movie theaters to take people to the hospital if they were overwhelmed with fear. And one guy actually passed out from fear and he claimed it was because of these uh, subliminal images of a demon, which you see on my slide here. 
Uh, they're not, technically speaking, they're not subliminal. They're, they're just flashed very briefly throughout the movie. But they scared him so badly that he passed out. He fell into the seat in front of him uh, and he broke his jaw. And so he sued the production company and he got uh, money for getting hurt. Uh, so on the face of it, uh, it's kind of weird that so many people are attracted to entertainment that's designed to frighten them. It's weird that so many people are attracted to movies and stories and video games and other forms of leisure activities that are designed to stimulate negative emotions like fear, anxiety, disgust, dread, terror, and so on. Um, and I think that paradox, the paradoxical appeal of horror has led many people to believe that it's, it's really a niche sort of thing. Something that appeals only to a tiny subset of the population and a subset of the population that is somehow, uh, um, you know, wired wrong. You know, uh, that there's something wrong with people who are interested in scary entertainment. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we wanted to fi find out uh, whether it is indeed a minority phenomenon, whether it, whether it is indeed uh, primarily teenage boys who seek out horror movies. Uh, so we did a study. We asked uh, more than a thousand Americans about their relationship with frightening media, uh, including horror movies, films, video games. And we found that more than half, about 55%, say, I like frightening media. That's not a niche, you know, that's not a tiny subset of, of the population. That's the majority. So most people, if you ask them, will say that they enjoy frightening media. About 17% are sort of on the fence. Uh, they might not consider themselves fans, but they might be willing to catch a scary movie on Saturday night if, if there is nothing better to do. And that means only the remaining 28%, that's less than a third, claim that they don't like horror at all. So this is my first take home message. Uh, the appetite for frightening media is not a minority phenomenon. It is a majority phenomenon. My second take home message is that gender differences aren't as significant as people used to think. Um, and so if you ask people, do you, do you like horror? Males and females will answer pretty much the same. If you ask them how often they seek out scary media, they'll often say very, they'll say very similar things as well. And if you ask about intensity preference, how scary do you want your horror to be? Men and women say very similar things. You'll see that in these three categories, enjoyment, frequency, and intensity, males score a little higher than females. Uh, so males are statistically speaking, slightly more likely to enjoy horror. They use it more frequently and they want it to be a little bit more scary, but it's not a very big difference. Um, so it's not a male genre. It's, an, it's a genre that appeals to males as well as females. The only truly significant gender difference that we find is when we ask people how easily scared they are of horror. In that case, the women are more uh, willing to admit that they're easily scared by uh, scary entertainment. Uh, it could be a result of biology that women are biologically predisposed to react more strongly to so-called negative stimuli. It could be a result of socialization that women are, generally speaking, raised to believe it's okay to express your emotions, or it could be a combination of the two. Anyway, the, the, the point of this graph is just to say that uh, it's not a male thing. Uh, it appeals to, to women and, and, uh, and men uh, almost equally with a few interesting differences once we start looking at subgenre, for example, uh, but that's another story. Um, the third take home message is, it's not just about the negative emotions. And anybody who is a horror fan knows this. It's not just about fear and anxiety and disgust and dread and terror. It's also about pleasure. It's about deriving pleasure from negative emotions. So what this shows is, the emotions that people expect to feel depending on whether they're horror fans or not. So uh, each of these five chunks of bars represent uh, people who are either horror fans or people who hate horror. So all the way to the right in the plot here, you'll see what horror fans say when you ask them about the emotions they expect to feel. 
uh, all the way to the left, you'll see what kinds of emotions somebody who hates horror expects to feel when they seek out horror. And if you look at the purple bar in the middle, you'll see that, and that's fear. You'll see that everybody expects to feel very high levels of fear when they seek out horror. That's not surprising. I mean, horror is defined by the intended audience reaction. Uh, but if you look at something like joy, that's a light blue bar, horror fans expect to feel almost double the joy that a horror hater expects to feel. So what is happening here is that Horror fans expect to feel pleasure when they seek out entertainment that stimulates negative emotion, when they are frightened by a story or a movie. That's what they find pleasurable. So it's not only about negative emotion, it's about co-activation of negative and positive emotion, which means there is no paradox. It really isn't that weird. It's just one way in which people find meaningful pleasure is by seeking out scary entertainment. Apart from being um, not that paradoxical and being hugely popular with both sexes, uh, horror is also very, very old. And Lovecraft recognized this a uh, hundred years ago. And I imagine many of you will have read Lovecraft's wonderful little book uh, called Supernatural Horror and Literature, which to my mind is one of the best things written about horror ever. Uh, it is so insightful. And actually, many of Lovecraft's claims have since been supported by science. Uh, I wrote a chapter by, uh, on that topic, which I'm happy to share if anybody wants to read it. Uh, but Lovecraft talked about how uh, the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. And he, so, so he drew the conclusion that it's not really that weird that stories that are designed to evoke that ancient emotion are also very uh, old. And indeed, we can trace the elements of horror way into the mists of prehistory. Uh, just consider any folk tale. There are many folk tales that have horrific elements like monsters and trolls and witches that eat children alive and so on. And even though today we associate horror with entertainment, I mean, when you say horror, most people think about entertainment, things to do for fun. We know that historically, uh, scary stories have served other purposes than entertainment. For example, in the domain of uh, behavioral regulation. Uh, so scary stories have been used to get kids to behave in a certain way. Stories about the horrible things that will happen if they stray from the path in the woods, for example. That's a very effective way of getting people to behave is to tell them a scary story about bloody monsters that will tear off their heads in their sleep and, you know, drink their 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 blood. Um, also, in addition to being ancient and popular, uh, horror is a genre that exists across media and different media have different affordances, you know, different, uh, there are different benefits and different shortcomings. So the literary medium, uh, here's a page from The Shining, one of my own personal favorite novels. In horror literature, typically what we get is a combination of descriptions of terrifying things and descriptions of fictional characters who respond to terrifying things. And that creates a, a kind of uh, double uh, assault on the reader where we are being invited to hold in our minds, you know, through our imagination, through verbal depiction, hold uh, terrible, disgusting, uh, horrifying images. And we respond to those images because the human imagination is wired into the human emotional system. So if we imagine something, we respond emotionally to it. And so we have terrifying images in our minds, but we also have descriptions of usually sympathetic characters who respond to those uh, terrifying things. And so we empathize with those characters. And that uh, element of providing psychological access to sympathetic characters who are confronted with terrifying things is a characteristic of horror literature. Horror movies aren't as good as providing psychological access, uh, but they can still provide you with uh, reaction shots. For example, in my picture here from uh, The Blair Witch Project, uh, which is a 90 minute film about three young people lost in the woods, uh, dying. Uh, that's pretty much what happens. You know, it's a very, uh, in a sense, it's a very low action movie because nothing happens except for these three kids who uh, stumble around in the woods. But there is a lot of um, 
a lot of reaction shots where we see them looking terrified. And that's very effective in inviting us to empathize with them. And of course, the, the, the horror movie medium is an audiovisual medium, meaning that it combines the elements of, of the visual with an auditory component, sound. And sound is extremely important in horror movies, for example, in producing jump scares. Uh, and so jump scares are a combination of a terrifying uh, sudden visual component with a sudden loud noise that makes people jump because it stimulates a startle response, which is a biologically very primitive reflex. Uh, and horror video games uh, can do the same thing because it's also an audiovisual medium. Uh, only the video game adds the element of interaction. So you can do, do things in the, in the virtual world. And the image on my slide here is from a Swedish uh, horror, uh, survival horror video game called Amnesia, The Dark Descent, which has Lovecraftian elements, uh, in which it looks as if you're looking through the eyes of the, of the character you're controlling inside the game's world. Um, and that visual alignment of player and avatar, along with the element of interaction, the fact that your behavior has consequences for the way in which the story unfolds, those two elements combine to give a, uh, a very high sense of immersion or presence of feeling you are in the virtual world uh, and you feel there is something at stake. Uh, and so that's why the horror video game is very good at stimulating high levels of fear because this feeling of being in the virtual world is so powerful. Uh, interestingly, I think the horror video game has proven more hospitable to Lovecraftian horror than movies. I'm not sure why, but uh, uh, that's just a, a curious fact. Now, there is another uh, interesting uh, medium for horror, which is uh, the haunted house or the haunted attraction. Um, and in the United States, haunted houses have been around for almost 100 years. Uh, commercial attractions or neighborhood attractions in which you have a location that is designed to be scary. And people can walk through usually a series of rooms with uh, scary set design and scare actors uh, to have this um, experience of recreational fear. And the haunted house is really interesting because it is a kind of horror experience in which the guest becomes, in a sense, the protagonist in a horror movie that unfolds in real time in the physical world where the empirical environment becomes full of danger, or at least full of cues of danger. And so that's really effective also for immersion. And this picture I'm showing you here is a picture taken by a hidden camera in a Danish haunted attraction uh, developed by a company called Dystopia Entertainment. These are actual guests who have gone into a, uh, it's a huge abandoned factory that each year is designed, is, is converted to a factory of horror in which thousands of people come from all over Denmark, pay good money to be scared for about 45 or 50 minutes. Uh, they walk through in groups, almost always in groups. It's very rarely uh, a solitary thing, just like with horror movies. Uh, most people watch horror movies in groups. But they come to the haunted house uh, in groups, they walk through about 50 rooms and get frightened. Um, five, six, seven percent of the guests don't make it through because they're overwhelmed with fear. And so they have to be escorted out or indeed occasionally carried out. Uh, and it's really, it's a wonderful place for us as researchers, because if you want to research, if you want to investigate fear empirically, uh, there are very strict limits to what you can do in a lab. Um, because if you want to invite people into a lab and you want to give them a jump scare, you know, hide a research assistant into inside a cupboard, uh, the ethics committee will tell you, no, you can't do it. Uh, forget about it. But we can go to a haunted attraction in which people have paid money to be scared. And we can measure physiology. We can measure behavior. We can talk to them. We can give them questionnaires. So it really is a treasure trove of, of data. Um, and by the way, the guests on this picture, what is happening here is that they are confronted with a character called uh, Mr. Piggy, uh, who's a big guy with a kind of pig's mask, fake blood on him, and he has a gas-driven chainsaw, and he's hiding inside the darkness, and suddenly he fires up the chainsaw, and he comes roaring at the guests. 
And that's a really frightening thing. Um, that's not something I think, it's something I know because we have measured a heart rate of guests. And what you see here at the peak, that's what happens to one guest when Mr. Piggy comes running toward them from, from the darkness. So it really is a very effective uh, character. Here are some more guests from Dystopia Haunted House, a mom and her daughter who are terrified by a zombie actor. Even this guy, you know, he looks like a kind of scary guy. He's terrified of the teenage girl in, in zombie makeup. So people flock to this haunted attraction to experience recreational fear, to be scared, but also to derive pleasure from being scared. Uh, that's not, by the way, the only reason people come. Um, what I'm showing you here is a picture of a group of guests who have walked into a room, which is almost completely dark, and then suddenly a flash of light comes on and a bunch of zombies jump out and scream at them. And if you look at their faces, you can see a whole range of different uh, facial uh, expressions, ranging from skepticism to disgust to fear. But what is especially interesting is the expression of the, on the face of the, of the, of the male. Um, he looks like he's really happy about something that's going on uh, down around his left arm. I think the fact that his female companions, the companion is holding on to him. Um, that in, in uh, that's called the snuggle effect. It's well documented in horror research that especially young people sometimes seek out scary entertainment as a sort of catalyst for um, romantic bonding. I think that's what's happening here. He was really hoping to uh, get in with the young lady at his side. So that's just another function horror can have is to act as a as a uh, as a kind of social glue. It brings people together, um, and even romantically, you know, makes people move closer together in the darkness of the movie theater or in the dark darkness of the haunted attraction. Lots of interesting things happening in a haunted house, and that's why we've been doing research. My group and I, my good colleagues, have been collecting data in Dystopia Haunted House since 2016 where uh, dozens and dozens of volunteers from the English department have joined us on uh, trips to the haunted house, um, along with several colleagues, including these gentlemen here on the slide, Uffe Schutt uh, at the top and Mark Arneson at the bottom. Um, so we've been doing these studies for six years now, collecting data from Dystopia Haunted House to learn something about the psychological machine room of recreational fear, including horror. And the first study we did was one we did back in 2016, where we were interested in learning something about fear regulation strategies. So we wanted to know what people do to regulate, to manipulate, to adjust their own fear when they seek out uh, scary uh, entertainment experiences. And so what we did was, we recruited 280 guests at Dystopia Haunted House, and we told them that we would pay their ticket if they accepted a challenge. And they could choose between two different challenges. Either they could try to become as afraid as possible, so maximize their own fear, try to make their fear go as high as possible, or they could try to minimize their fear, try to keep their fear down. And as it happened, half the guests chose the maximize fear condition and the other half chose the minimize fear condition, which in itself is very interesting. And so they went through the haunt and then we talked to them and we asked them about their fear. We asked them about enjoyment and we asked them about the different strategies they had used to either maximize or minimize their fear. And on this picture, you're seeing guests who are, you can almost see it, you know, you can tell from their posture, the way in which they're standing. They're trying to keep fear down. In contrast, uh, this group is just, you know, letting go, maximizing fear. But here's the interesting thing. If you look at the two gray bars on the left, what you see are fear scores, self-reported fear levels in the two different conditions. So the people who were embracing fear and trying to maximize fear reported much higher fear levels on average, 7.5 on a 10-point scale going from 0 to, to 9, uh, than the people trying to minimize fear. The, minim the people trying to minimize fear, so the people in the top picture, reported much lower uh, fear levels. Uh, 
So they got less scared. They didn't report no fear. So they didn't succeed in completely switching off fear. And we didn't expect them to, because we know from other scientific studies that you can't really switch off fear. You know, it sort of has its own life. The human fear system is, it's ancient and it's cognitively relatively encapsulated. So kind of uh, kept out of the reach of rational thought, at least to a certain extent. You can manipulate it, you can regulate it, but you can't really switch it off. Um, so there were differences in fear levels. But if you look at the satisfaction scores, that's the two gray bars on the right. How much did they enjoy it? There aren't that huge difference. So they found it really fun in both groups, both the fear minimizers and the fear maximizers. So this study led us to believe that there are two different kinds of horror fans. One kind that we call the adrenaline junkie. Those are the people you see in the bottom picture. The adrenaline junkie finds enjoyment in maximum stimulation. Uh, they're just trying to, you know, they want a kick, they want arousal, they want stimulation. The other kind we call white knucklers. And they're people who watch a horror movie or go to a haunted house and they clench their fists, you know, so that their knuckles turn white. Uh, they also enjoy horror, but they see it as more of a, a, a challenge to themselves in making it through a terrifying experience with their mental health intact, you know, trying to keep their own fear at a tolerable level. So white knucklers and adrenaline junkies, two different kinds of horror fans, two different ways in which you can derive pleasure from scary entertainment. So that was the first study. That was fun. And then we did another study the following year, 2017, which involved a whole army of research assistants. Uh, and in which we, and this is my lab after a, a night of data collection in the haunted house, because it's a, it's a messy place in which to collect data. Uh, but what we did here is we were interested in investigating horror as a kind of play behavior. Because we think when people seek out horror, what they're really doing is they're playing with fear. Uh, experiencing strong negative emotions, uh, but in a playful context. They know there is no real danger. They know it's make-believe. They know it's actors and words on a page, images in their minds, uh, images on a screen. And so what we did here is we mounted uh, heart rate monitors on the guests. We mounted uh, surveillance cameras and infrared lights in different rooms in the haunted attraction so that we could film behavior in the dark. And then we um, had questionnaires to, um, to ask a bunch of questions. And I can show you a video of some of my research assistants who walked through the haunted house. And so what you see in the, vi in the video is the assistants entering a room and then an actor comes along and the actor has a kind of unsettling, disturbing monologue. And you wanna pay special attention to the young woman in the front here. Uh, so the group comes into the room and the actor gives them the unsettling monologue. And the monologue has two functions. One is to disturb the guests, to freak them out, to creep them out. You know, he has a fake hand and a, and a fake skull. He says crazy things. The other function is to distract the guests from the fact that a zombie character is hiding underneath the table behind them. And the zombie is waiting for a cue, which the actor gives now. He comes up and he scares the guests. And so you can see how footage like this gives us a wealth of data on behavior. You know, How do people act when they come into the room? How do they behave when they get a jump scare? Do they scream? Do they laugh? Do they scream and then laugh? Uh, do they stay close to each other? Do they look around to see if they can spot the jump scare or the exit? Uh, but the most interesting finding from this study when we looked at the relationship between enjoyment and fear. Because traditionally, people have thought that there is a linear relationship between fear and enjoyment. You know, the more fear, the more enjoyment. The scarier, the better. And you, you'll probably have seen how many horror movies are marketed on their ability to really frighten people. You know, this is the scariest movie you'll ever see. This movie will make you sleep with the lights on for two weeks, that sort of thing. Which kind of buys into this idea that there is a linear relationship. But actually what we found both when we asked people and when we looked at their heart uh, rate, uh, we found it isn't a linear relationship. It's more like an inverted U when you plot it on this, on a, on, a, on a graph like we did here, 
where you find in the middle a kind of sweet spot of fear, where there is just the right amount of fear and maximum enjoyment. You don't want it to be too scary, the book or the movie or the video game or the haunted house. If it's too scary, it becomes overwhelming and unpleasant. If it's not scary enough, it becomes boring. So you want just the right amount of fear for it to be a kind of playful experience. And this discovery of a sweet spot of fear uh, underpins a new research project at the lab, uh, for which we just got funding, and it's called the Apex of Fear. And it, we haven't actually started on this project yet, uh, but it, it kicks off in January. And uh, we are hiring a really talented uh, programmer, game developer, and psychologist to develop an artificial intelligence that lets a horror virtual reality simulation adapt to the player. So what we're going to do is we're going to put uh, virtual reality headsets on players and a bunch of different uh, sensors so that we get physio physiological data on fear levels, for example, by looking at skin conductance, how much do they sweat, uh, heart rate. We can look at blink rate, uh, breathing, suspense, how much tension do they feel by mounting sensors on certain muscles. And that will allow us to see, to measure where they are on this uh, curve of fear. And then the, the video game, the, the simulation can make sure that they're constantly in the sweet spot. If they start to get bored, and we can see this uh, physiologically, or the artificial intelligence can detect it, then it might throw in a few jump scares into the simulation or turn down the lights. If people begin to be overwhelmed with fear, you know, it can make it a little bit less scary. And also the video game can adapt to the player's fears. So it can tell if somebody is afraid of spiders relative to rats, for example, and throw in some more spiders. Uh, there might be a monster that moves only when people blink because we have sensors that detect a blink rate. And so people have to keep their eyes open. Or maybe we could design a simulation so that if the heart rate uh, beats per minute go over like 110, the monster catches them so that they have to keep fear down. That could maybe be a good, uh, that could, might have clinical uh, applications uh, in training people to control their own fear. Uh, so that's a fun new project that grows out of this um, collaboration we have with the Haunted House. Another project is uh, getting more into this uh, playing with fear idea that horror is a kind of uh, threat simulation and way in which we simulate worst case scenarios and, and play with our own responses. Um, and that idea led us to do a pilot study on recreational fear in Danish daycare institutions. So do we find recreational fear in nurseries and kindergartens? And if you call teachers in nurseries and kindergartens and ask them if they scare the kids, they say no. But then if you ask more kind of detailed questions about any kind of activity in which the kids feel a little bit of fear, but also some pleasure, it turns out that recreational fear activities are very widespread in nurseries and kindergartens. So for example, you have peekaboo, which is a kind of uh, infant jump scare. Uh, you have uh, chase play, you have hide and seek, you have playing in the dark, uh, uh, scary nursery rhymes with gruesome and terrifying content. Uh, you just read out stories like the three Billy uh, Goats Gruff, um, scary stories for the kids using, you know, monster voices. And they take the kids into nature and tell them that monsters are living in the woods and so on. And these teachers in Danish uh, kindergartens and nurseries who do these things don't do them because they're sadistic. They do them because they have an intuition that it's good for the kids to get a chance to play with fear and to learn something about what it feels like to be afraid or anxious and to learn coping skills. And even though uh, there is a lot of research on negative effects of especially audiovisual horror for kids, you know, research that documents that most people have some kind of so-called traumatic memory of watching a scary movie when they were 10 or 11 or 12 and sleeping with the lights on or sleeping with their parents. Uh, there has been very little research on the positive effects. Uh, but there's now reason to believe that there might be positive effects of 
uh, children's engagement with uh, recreational fear and that the positive effects might outweigh the negative effects. So we know from other studies involving monkey babies that a little bit of stress is actually good for a monkey baby because it works as a kind of inoculation, a vaccine. So monkey babies that experience a moderate amount of stress when they're very young actually turn out to be more resilient uh, against stress when they grow up, more so than monkey babies who have been extremely stressed uh, and also more so than monkey babies who have experienced no stress at all. So you need just this little thing of fear and anxiety uh, to allow you to build resilience, just like the vaccines. We did a study in which we investigated this idea. Uh, it was published um, last year. Uh, but we collected the data in the beginning of the lockdown in, I think, April 2020. Because we wanted to know if horror fans, if fans of horror movies have better psychological resilience during lockdown than people who don't watch horror movies. And I know it sounds maybe like a crazy thing to do. Uh, but we thought that if you watch a lot of horror movies, you will have trained yourself in the fine art of fear regulation. Uh, because watching a horror movie is not a passive thing. You know, it looks like a passive thing when somebody is sitting in a couch and looking at the screen and maybe looking a little bit scared. And behaviorally, yes, it is passive. But psychologically, a lot of things are happening when you're watching a horror movie. Um, for example, you're trying to regulate your own fear. If it's a very scary movie, you might be telling yourself, it's only a movie, it's only a movie, it's only a movie. Or, you know, it's just actors, or you might try to distract yourself, or you might use behavioral fear regulation strategies like covering your eyes. Um, and so we thought people who have a lot of experience regulating their fear through engagement with horror movies might actually be better at regulating fear in response to a real world pandemic. And that is indeed what we found. So horror fans reported uh, less symptoms of psychological distress during COVID lockdown than non-fans. They had fewer sleep problems, fewer problems uh, concentrating and so on. We also found that people who watch a lot of so-called prepper movies, uh, movies about the end of the world, disaster movies, zombie apocalypse movies, alien invasion movies, those people felt more prepared for the pandemic. Um, and, you know, these are images from a zombie movie called World War Z. But that's pretty much what my local supermarket looked like on the day that the country was put into lockdown. And I thought to myself, hmm, sure, I know where this is going. I've seen many apocalyptic movies. And even though the zombies in zombie apocalypse movies are unrealistic, the, the, the depiction of the social effects of society or societal collapse are usually fairly plausible. And that's where you can learn something. Um, so it's not just a waste of time when people watch uh, zombie apocalypse movies or scary movies or read Lovecraft stories or visit haunted attractions. Um, I want to tell you about a, another study we did in the haunted house. Um, this is the last study I will dwell on. Uh, but we did a study in which we wanted to learn more about these different kinds of horror fans, the adrenaline junkies and the white knucklers. And so um, we uh, designed a questionnaire that allowed us to identify which type of horror fan people are. And we found out there aren't, there aren't two kinds, there are actually three kinds. So the, excuse me, the adrenaline junkies, the ones who want maximum stimulation, the white knucklers, uh, who see it as a more of a, a challenge in, in making it through in one piece, and a third kind that we call the dark copers. And a dark coper tends to be somebody who has some kind of um, psychological mental health issue, people with depression or anxiety, who are also horror fans. And I was really surprised when I first heard about this. People with anxiety disorder seeking out scary movies. I mean, what's going on? Uh, but it may be the case that if you have an anxiety disorder, you find yourself in a kind of a fog of free-floating anxiety over which you have no control and that has no clear source. It just, you know, en envelops you and um, you can't do anything about it. But when you seek out a horror movie or go to a haunted attraction or read a horror novel, 
you know exactly what the source of your anxiety is. It's the scary characters. It's the frightening depictions. Uh, and you have full control. You can leave the haunted house. You can switch off the movie. You can close the book. And so maybe for people with anxiety disorder, at least some people with anxiety disorder, recreational fear activities such as horror or haunted houses might be a means in which they can or a way for them to practice uh, emotion regulation. So what we found in this study, uh, when we looked at what people get out of it, is that the adrenaline junkies get a mood boost. They go come to the haunted house, they go through, they come out, and they're in a better mood. That's not the case for the white knucklers. And any, if anything, they're in a slightly worse mood. But they feel they learn something about themselves at the end that they develop as a person. Um, and the dark copers, they get all three benefits. But I think this uh, aspect of feeling you learn something from frightening entertainment and feeling that you develop as a person is very interesting. Because again, it, it uh, contrasts with this uh, prejudice that it's mindless entertainment, uh, harmful at worst, uh, uh, and mindless at best. But actually, Many people feel they learn something about their own responses. They learn something about what it feels like to be afraid. They learn something about their, their limits, their tolerance. And they feel they grow as a person, that they now can do things that they couldn't do before once they have made it through a very scary movie or, or a haunted house. Uh, these are some quotations from some of the guests, but they're in Danish, so I'll have to translate them. But we asked the guests, so what do you feel you learned about yourself? What is it you feel you, how do you feel you developed? And people say things like, how I react to being frightened. Or I now know that I can avoid uh, panicking. Or I learned something about controlling my anxiety. I learned something about how I react under pressure. Uh, I learned that I listened to my gut instinct. I learned that I can do more than I thought I could. Um, so there is a, apparently a real learning potential here in in this uh, in this domain. Now the final slide, and then I'll uh, shut up. But the final slide shows a study we just uh, finished in the haunted house, in which we were interested in the relationship between interoception and fear. And interoception is the process where people. Um, detect signals from their own body. So you all know about exteroception. When we see something or hear something, you know, we, um, we receive signals from the external world, but we also always receive uh, signals from the internal world, our own body. So the, the belly might tell you, I'm getting hungry now, it's growling. Your heart might, might be racing and telling you, I'm getting a little bit anxious now. Uh, but it turns out that not everybody is equally good at accurately detecting those interoceptive signals. And possibly people with anxiety disorder are very aware of their body's own signals, but very bad at accurately decoding them. So they have a hard time telling how fast their heart is beating. Um, and we wanted to see if interoceptive ability had any kind of relation, meaningful relationship with how frightened people get inside the haunted house. It could be that people who don't get very frightened are very good at accurately decoding the signals from their body. And so we did a study in which we mounted uh, rate monitors on guests and collect data on their interoceptive ability. But we haven't analyzed the data yet, so I don't know what the results are. I just wanted to mention it as another example of how we can use this setting up the haunted house to learn some in interesting things about fear and recreational fear and um, this peculiar phenomenon of people voluntarily seeking out uh, frightening entertainment. But that's all I wanted to say. Um, I don't know if I stuck within the, I went five minutes over time at least according to my own ambition, but hopefully that's okay. Yes, it's okay. It's not an academic conference. <laughs> But it was really interesting, Matthias. Thank you very much. Like uh, now you gave us a lot of material for, uh, well, to understand why we who are fans of horror, why we seek it, uh, whether we are adrenaline junkies, uh, white knockers or dark copers. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's very important. I, I did want to mention, because uh, I think it's, 
this, this is the way I got to meet you. Uh, and I think it's a very important and relevant part of the research you've been doing, what you've been publishing. And it is that the, the, the framework from which you approach horror, it's an evolutionary framework. You mm. talk, uh, you mentioned constantly biological factors, neuroscience, uh, measures uh, of the body responses. And uh, I think it's very interesting also to, to mention that uh, you part from an evolutionary perspective uh, in which fear is seen as um, evolutionary, um, like an, a strategy no, of survival mm -hmm. that uh, through human history, it has given us the chance of not only survive, but also to get pleasure. And uh, yeah, that's why uh, I think it's very interesting what you say, like there is no horror paradox because mm. uh, it does gives us something positive. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Let's start with the people on Zoom who wants to start. Uh, if you guys want to write your names in the chat so that I can uh, uh, know who to give the word first. Okay, let's start with Chavo and then uh, Pepe Palmantes. Chavo. Thank you, thank you, Gabby. Uh, Matias, it was an amazing, an amazing uh, chat. Uh, I'm really, I feel really fortunate to, to live in these times that people actually are using new tools, modern tools to, to investigate something that maybe was not that important before or, or at least for psychologists only or maybe maybe psychiatrist but it's good to have it in other other fields involved now uh, i wanted to ask one of many questions uh, first uh, do you think it can because i feel i am a mixture between a white knocker and, and a, a scare junk, junkie i mean can you be some days when you go with some kind of people can you behave like this and then you go with other crew to the same uh, haunted house and you be, behave completely different? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and my answer is going to be disappointing because I don't know. Uh, and that's the thing about recreational fear is that the things we know, th these are the things we know and these are the things we don't know. You know, there's, there's so much that still has not been investigated. And that, in a sense, that's awesome for a researcher like me because there are so many things still to find out. It's also frustrating that there is so little we know. I think it's an excellent question. You can, I mean, does one change over the course of one's life? I mean, I can imagine some people might be more adrenaline junkie like in their teenage years and then they grow old and they become more kind of white nugglery. Uh, maybe also even during the course of a day, you know, when you get tired and hungry and maybe you're less, so, but I don't know. It's, it's a really good question. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Talamantes? Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Matthias. It was an excellent presentation with a lot of data, data and insight that we usually don't think about it. Uh, I have a quick question. Do you have any data about people's uh, backgrounds or cultures or upbringing about what kind of, of entertainment horror they, they prefer? Uh, I ask you this because usually here in Mexico, we are not really a, a create, creator or producer of this kind of uh, horror films. Uh, we usually kind of lean to the to the folklore horror about the smallish towns and and legends and all kind of fables and all kind of the stuff. Oh, that's really cool. Um, it's it's been a while since I, I've done some theoretical work on the interplay between biology and culture and the expression of horror. Um, I think horror is universal and you find scary stories everywhere. Uh, they may take different shapes uh, for a bunch of different reasons in different cultures. Uh, we haven't really looked empirically at different cultural backgrounds and how that may affect people's engagement with horror. Uh, we have looked at personality traits, uh, different personality profiles to see 
if there was any kind of correlation with um, horror behavior. And we did find that people who enjoy horror tend to be uh, fairly interested in intellectual stimulation. Um, they're characterized by scoring fairly high on a personality trait called openness to experience, which I thought was a fun thing. Uh, because again, it goes kind of against this uh, old idea of horror fans as somehow unsophisticated um, people of poor taste. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, so I know uh, th there is research on on the culture and the kind of cultural context of, of horror. There's not something I know a huge amount about, but thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Abraham, you have a question? Hi, Matthias. Good afternoon. Um, you were talking about using um, um, advanced artificial intelligence to improve the, the way of the experience, to improve the experience for, uh, for the person who is in this, uh, in this, in this uh, haunted house attraction or, or to improve the response to, to a movie. But um, my question is regarding as it's happening in music, when you find an algorithm to um, develop a better experience, commercially talking, aren't you also putting a bit of risk on the freedom of the creator, this um, need for experimentation to, to tell something different that maybe is not exactly is not is not something uh, specifically developed for the market but something more experimental i don't know maybe is is something I, i i'm watching happening in music mm. i don't know no, I think... yeah no i think that's a real that's a real um uh... That's a real issue. It's a real concern. Um, and I would, any, any future in which artificial intelligence is an algorithm, commercial algorithms take over the field of, of culture, to me is a dystopian uh, future. Uh, because we need, the, uh, we need the geniuses. We need the people who think outside the box. We need the Lovecrafts uh, to uh, shake things up and provide new, I mean, The artificial and the computer will only produce variations on what we give it. It isn't really creative. Um, and I don't think this experience that we're hoping to develop will replace other kinds of horror experiences. If it did, I would kill it on the spot. <laughs> so uh, it's, that, I think that's a very important point to bring up. It does allow us to do interesting things and to create a personalized experience. And to, it's really for us, it's a pipeline of data because we will be putting people into the simulation and getting a lot of data that we can then use to improve our understanding. But the uh, the real, the human horror artists, I don't think cannot be replaced by even a very advanced artificial intelligence with access to, to endless data, nope. I would like to add to that question uh, because this, uh, at least uh, the project seems to be initially Uh, oriented towards haunted attractions. Uh, can we talk about outer ship in haunted attractions? Like uh, up to which point can we say like uh, a haunted attraction has an author behind it, uh, a creative mind or a creative team? Like uh, how have you, you who have uh, worked closely with dystopia entertainment, mm -hmm. for example? Yeah. So, so for dystopia entertainment, it's kind of like a, a movie where you also have a whole crew behind the movie with different well-defined roles. So producers and directors and screenwriters and uh, technical personnel and actors and so on. It's the exact same thing in the haunted house. You know, on any given night of operation, there might be 140 individuals, about 70 or 80 of whom are... Um, actors and then you have security and first aid and makeup and people who take care of food and so on 
but there are you know creative people behind it people who come with a vision and then other people who say we can't do that it's too expensive and uh so in that sense in so far as you can talk about authorship in the domain of movies you can also talk about it in the domain of, of haunted attractions thank you uh, Morgan, can you tell us uh, what's going on on Facebook, the Facebook Live? Yes, thank you, Gabby. And thank you so much, Matthias Clayson, for this conversation. It's been amazing. Um, we have some uh, people on online. Rogelio says, hi. Hi, Rogelio Cesario. I'll, um, who else? Jesus Humano, he says he wants to read the article you said you could share. So he asked for the link. Uh, Robert? Um, I, I don't have a link for that one. He would have to send me an email. And anybody who's listening could send me an email and I'm happy to send a PDF back. Okay. Thank you very much. Roberto Martinez says hi. And John Garcia says um, he wished for a local attraction to come and not get canceled. Well, that's hmm. an inside joke because here in, in our town, um, we got one haunted house that was canceled wow. for um, religious. Relig religious reasons. So I don't know. Yeah, crazy. But there has been some. other. There has been other. Wasn't uh, the nightmare before Christmas also canceled uh, in some cities in in Mexico when it came out? Really, I don't know about yeah, that. Yeah, that's what we have to work with, Matthias. Yes. <laughs> Or in Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> and also John asked if there's a therapy that involves uh, fear mm -hmm. and which disorders could benefit from it. Mm -hmm. I think, um, so we know that if, if somebody suffers from anxiety disorder or a phobia, uh, usually what they get if they contact a psychologist is some kind of exposure theory. A therapy. So they're exposed to the thing that frightens them in small but increasingly larger doses. So if you're afraid of spiders, first you have to think about a spider and then look at a picture and then look at a fake one and then a small real one and a bigger real one and eventually you'll have a tarantula crawling on your hand and hopefully that extinguishes your fear. And it may be that we can use horror also as a kind of tool in exposure therapy. That's certainly something we're hoping to um, to pursue, not least in this apex of fear study. And I think for, for those dark copers who have some kind of anxiety disorder or mood disorder, what they're doing when they seek out horror, whether it's uh, reading scary stories or going to a haunt or watching scary movies, what they're doing is self-medicating. That's what they tell me anyway. When I talk to people like that, they tell them, they tell me that, you know, it, it helps for a while with their mood problem or anxiety problem. So, uh, and this is something almost almost no research exists on this. So there really is something we need to figure out here. Thank you so much. And we also have a question from Aldo Sanchez. He, he says the information, well, it's not a question. The information and hard data provided by Matias Research has been very interesting and accurate. Thanks for sharing this. Thank you. And we have another question. Um, Jesus Humano says, uh, is it a correlation between the tendency to enjoy recreational fear and feel animosity towards, towards real crime? I don't know. Um, what I do know is uh, I have a colleague in Chicago. His name is Colton Scrivener. He's a behavioral scientist, and he does research on um, something he calls morbid curiosity, which is a, it's a personality trait, and it's curiosity about morbid things like uh, disgusting things or gruesome things. And he has found that morbid curiosity is normally distributed, so everybody has some norm, uh, morbid curiosity. Uh, but some people have extreme amounts of it, and some people have very, very little, but most people have, you know, reason, a reasonable amount of morbid curiosity. But it has different, four different aspects or facets. So there is morbid curiosity, curiosity about the motives of dangerous people. Uh, and that's the kind of morbid curiosity you have if you're interested in serial killer movies or true crime podcasts or 
uh, scary entertainment that focuses on the mind of the killer. And then there is another kind of morbid curiosity that is about social violence, and curiosity about what it looks like when people are engaged in a physical conflict, boxing, fighting. And then there is a morbid curiosity that is directed at the occult and the paranormal, the supernormal, curiosity about exorcisms and demons and so on. Uh, and then finally, a, a morbid curiosity that is about um, violations of the human body. What does it look like when the body is broken? What is, you know, what does a caretaker do? What does a pathologist, a forensic pathologist do? So different facets. And some people score high on one facet, but not the other. Um, and so the re reason I say this is, I think, um, morbid curiosity, it's a, it's a kind of learning mechanism. It's a it's an appetite that that evolution gave us so that we can learn about dangers of the world, be curious about threat in the surroundings, but at a safe distance. Uh, but that the one facet that has to do with the motives of dangerous people might also compel folks not only to be interested in, um, in horror stories with uh, dangerous people, but also crime stories and mystery stories. Um, so, so people who are horror fans tend to score high on morbid curiosity. I don't know if, the, if there is a relationship between being a fan of horror and having kind of strong moral feelings about crime. I don't think anybody has investigated that. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, we have a question uh, from Mariana, who's uh, here on, uh, in Zoom with us, but uh, who cannot uh, at the moment turn on her microphone. Uh, she mentions uh, that there is a page uh, that uh, measures the number of scary jumps in films. Uh, mm. I think it's called Where's the Jump Scare? Mm. Uh, and uh, she mentions that uh, it seems that uh, the number of jump scares have increased uh, since the 60s. Uh, do you have a theory or uh, uh, an idea of why has that happened? I do. Um, it's true. Uh, in the 60s, I think there were about 2.5 jump scares per horror movie. And today it's around 10 on average, uh, with a few horror movies that have many jump scares, like It from 2017. It has like 18, 20 jump scares. Uh, but I think there has been an increase. Uh, because uh, horror movie directors have come to realize that it's a very effective strategy. Um, it, it has kind of a bad reputation for being primitive, artless, uh, the last resort of the unimaginative horror filmmaker. But a jump scare can be a real work of art, you know, when it's timed just right. Uh, very often it's about, um, distract, you know, um, it's about making the viewer feel that they're safe, but then, you know, something jumps out and it really gets you. Uh, so it seems to have found a kind of optimum frequency of jump scares, which seems to be around 10 per feature length uh, movie. And I think, um, I think if you, if you imagine a movie with 200 jump scares, you would be exhausted at the end of the movie, right? You would be a smoking wreck. And your nervous system would be in shreds. A horror movie with no jump scare might be a little boring, you know. Uh, and I, I agree with those people who think that establishing an atmosphere of dread and sort of impending doom is probably more difficult than creating a jump scare. But I do think the jump scare has its function, not least in the social context of horror movies, because it's really funny to be watching a horror movie with friends or family. And then there is a jump scare and everybody jumps and you, you laugh at each other. Uh, I think that's that's part of the appeal, but I think I think there is an, a limit, both an upper and a, a lower limit to to um, to jump scares. You need just the right amount, and maybe ten jump scares per movie. That's around really, one jump scare per ten minutes. That's that's that seems to suit us well. That would be my guess. You you do mention and uh, recommend some movies that uh, have a. Uh few to non uh, jump scares mm. and among them uh, is uh, Bone Tomahawk which yep. uh, her Chagos and your suggestion because I read uh, your newest book uh, lately mm. and uh, it's as you say like uh, the jump scare is a very uh, good tool 
but uh, there it, there are ways to masterfully, yeah, uh, how do you say, traumatize a person like in Bone Tomahawk without a jump scare. Yeah. Yes. That's a good uh, recommendation if you don't like jump scares. Stefan, uh, he says, uh, he writes, extremely interesting, uh, super cool research in a seemingly obscure, but very relevant and interesting topic that can both be practically used and obviously used for enjoyment. Uh, Chavo, uh, you have a question. Yeah. Uh, what do you think the great masters of literature, of old horror, because we have new masters. We know the, the, the new masters are the ones who make movies, but before it was literature, what, what we were talking about this before. What do you think Lovecraft, Poe, Shirley Jackson, what, what would they say about you guys trying to rationalize, to, to find the, the formula they actually had naturally? What, 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 what did you take on them? Mm, what would they say question. to you? Yeah, I think if I woke up tonight and found that I was being haunted by the ghosts of Poe and Lovecraft, I think those two gentlemen would actually think that what we were doing at the Recreational Fear Lab is kind of cool because they were, you know, rationalists and interested in science and interested in the psychology of horror. Uh, Shirley Jackson might also approve. Um, I think there's also that there's, there's always that risk of um, unweaving the rainbow, you know, of uh, disenchanting or lessening the magic of the phenomenon you're trying to understand scientifically, because the scientific method is reductive. You do take something that's very complicated and reduce it into its constituent elements and try to understand those elements. Um, but, you know, I'm not really worried about that because even if we designed an experiment that said something about the psychology of a Lovecraft story. Um, the story still exists and everybody can benefit from reading the story and have that imaginative, you know, explosion happening when you encounter Lovecraft for the first time. Um, so I, th I think, I think they'd be okay with it. I hope. We also think they would be okay with it. <laughs> that's, that's a relief. Yes. Uh, I have a question, actually. Um, you were talking about the morbid curiosity, and mm -hmm. uh, also you've been talking about fear and how it has been uh, uh, questioned uh, morally, and uh, like society has uh, seen in horror uh, as something. Uh, 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 potentially damaging, especially mm. or maybe only when it's recreational, because, uh, for example, I don't know, in a society like Mexican society, we use horror constantly uh, through our tales of uh, the narcos and of the all the religious things. Uh, mm. My mom heard La Llorona or uh, the devil, etc. But when it's recreational, then people frown you. Mm. But I also was wondering, um, morbid curiosity, uh, as you say, it's something that, uh, that is also positive. It's a learning strategy. Mm. But why do you think it's so socially unaccepted? Because mm. uh, I also believe that we are all morbid at some point. But it seems like it is a very bad thing to be. Most people yeah. don't want to accept that they have that uh, morbidity. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm not sure. I think some of it has has to have to do with um, just uh, more or less arbitrary cultural hierarchies. Like we tend to think that the intellect is above the body, you know, and any fiction that appeals to the body that st sparks strong emotions or is about disgust or fear is inferior to the kind of thing that, you know, stimulates the intellect. Uh, but partly that's a, it's a false opposition because a horror movie or horror literature can stimulate the intellect just as much as the body. 
uh, and you know, I once I gave a lecture to a group of high school teachers, and this teacher came up to me and he said he'd always been wondering about why he remembered vividly, you know, crappy horror movies he'd watched 20 years ago, but he could not, for the life of him, remember the plot of a Paul Auster novel he read last last week. Um, and so I think most of us, when we when we look for entertainment or or art, uh, we want to be emotionally stimulated and also intellectually stimulated. Um, but if you don't know, if you don't realize that horror is just as intellectually stimulating as it is emotionally and bodily stimulating, then you might have the uh, perception that it's it's all about this, you know, primitive animalistic stuff, and it's about sensationalist themes that you shouldn't dwell on in polite society. Um, I'm, I don't know, but it's it's certainly annoying. I mean, to to I don't care personally, um, but I remember being a little bit uh, annoyed with the fact that people looked a little bit down on you if you were a horror fan, as opposed to a fan of um, general fiction or something else. Yeah, thankfully, it has become uh, less thrown upon, I think, in the last years. Uh, yeah. For example, in uh, our city, Monterrey, which is in the north of Mexico, uh, as Morgan said, is very conservative. But mm -hmm. still now we have some things like the, the horror fest. And uh, I think there's also zombie convention, no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's improving in that sense. But, uh, but yeah, like... Uh, Going back to what Talamantes was mentioning about the cultural uh, uh, background of uh, of the person who's experienced horror, uh, I, I guess it's very different. For example, uh, the horror that uh, is uh, exists in countries like Sweden or mm -hmm. Denmark to the horror uh, we have, for example, in Mexico. We were mm -hmm. discussing in uh, Halloween uh, here in the circle how, uh, because I'm in Sweden, I'm uh, in Gothenburg. Uh, at least in Sweden, uh, there's not, um, uh, the, the folklore is not that strong anymore. People uh, is mainly atheists and uh, people don't believe in ghosts or this paranormal. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I would like to ask you, how is it in Denmark? Is it similar like in Sweden or are they yeah. a little bit more in touch with the folk uh, tales? No, it's the same as in Sweden. Um, some, I think some parents try to pass on some of the folk tales to their kids. And there is a museum here in, in Denmark that just opened an exhibit on these super scary Danish folk tales. I mean, if you look at the folk beliefs from 150 years ago, it was full of scary stuff. And so they designed this exhibit that's almost completely dark and you get this electrical light and you walk through and it feels like it felt back in the 1800s when you were a farmer, you know, after sunset and all the monsters came out, at least out of your imagination. But Danes are like the Swedes who are generally speaking atheists and, and uh, yeah. Uh, out of uh, selfish reasons, may I know in which city is uh, set the museum? It's north of Olbo. It's in, it's in the north of Jutland, and it's very much worth a visit. Uh, what, what is the name of the museum? The museum is, I don't remember, but uh, I, can, I can look it up. It's, uh, it's, an, it's, an, it's, it's a fairly forgettable name, um, but I can look it up and send you a message. Yeah. Let's do that. Stefan, you had a question. Yeah, it's a sort of a strange question, I guess. It's, uh, well, Gabby is my wife, and I know uh, from watching movies with her that uh, due to her background with research and so on, it can be very boring sometimes because she knows what's going to happen in the next few seconds, you know? Mm -hmm. So my question to you, uh, Matthias, is uh, your research, has it made something more boring, like you personally speaking? Yeah, uh, you would think, um, no, actually no. Um, I do sometimes find myself, you know, sort of mindlessly analyzing camera work or patterns of editing when I'm watching a horror movie or I can tell myself, you know, okay, I can tell from the 
uh, combination of non-diegetic mu music and the, and the place in the plot that a jump scare is coming up in T minus 17 seconds, 16, 15. But I still jump when the jump scare comes and I can still appreciate you know, the, the, the artistry of beautiful camera work or effective editing. So I think, I think for me, it's more about increasing pleasure by combining the kind of phenomenologically naive approach to scary entertainment with a more kind of analytical, scholarly or scientific approach. I think you can watch it with both perspectives at the same time, actually. They don't necessarily cancel each other out. Okay, so that, that speaks a lot also to the, the hardwiredness of the human body as well. It does, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah really interesting. Thank you. That's something that I actually really liked about your newest book, uh, uh, A Very Nervous Person's uh, Guide to Horror Movies, because I am a very, like, uh, I think I can, uh, <laughs> I, I am a dark coper because I have mm -hmm. OCD. So I struggle with anxiety a lot, mm -hmm. but uh, I've been trying to, to, to watch more horror precisely because I have noticed that uh, it trains me in not mm -hmm. being that scared. But um, in your book, you write it. Uh, first, the structure of the book, uh, you go through different concerns that people can have about horror. For example, a chapter about uh, jump scares, a chapter about uh, what if it's harmful to my uh, spirituality or morality, what if it's morally wrong or why, what if it affects me physically. And I think it's it's very clever book because you also give advice uh, on how to control and uh, uh, manage fear for a nervous person, mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, behavioral uh, tricks, uh, covering your eyes, or also things like, okay, don't watch horror if you're tired, because, mm -hmm. and then you gave a physiological explanation that I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Can you give us examples of uh, things that people can do in order to increase the fear felt when watching a movie or doing something of horror recreation? Yeah, yeah, so so most of the things we know people do to increase fear, and we don't know anything about how effective it is, we only know what people actually do. Most of it is the opposite of what they do when they're trying to decrease fear. So if they wanna really be frightened, you know, they avoid distracting themselves because self-distraction is one of the best fear regulation strategies. If you're watching a horror movie and you start thinking about an exam paper that you have to do or getting uh, your car to the mechanic or something, then the fear goes down. But if you avoid being distracted and you avoid reminding yourself that it's just a movie or an artifact and you actively try to constantly sustain immersion uh, and that, that will be one way to increase fear. Uh, but I think it's harder to increase than it is to decrease. Um, because you're really, the, the, the horror movie in itself is designed for immersion. I mean, horror movies, almost all horror movies are designed in such a way that you're not supposed to pay attention to form. You're not supposed to notice the editing or the music or uh, the props and so on. You're supposed to, um, to, to process it as reality. Um, so that process is already... Uh, taking place and it's hard to improve on it um, so so that that's it's that's a little bit hard to say but you could avoid using the the strategies that you would use if you were trying to keep fear down yeah and of course watch it alone and turn off all the lights and turn up the volume well i asked for other people because i wouldn't do it no i wouldn't either no no yeah um here in the circle, we, we, we have different activities. We have uh, days where we watch uh, uh, short uh, horror short films together, but uh, and we have uh, different talks with writers and uh, with scholars and horror. But uh, we mainly read uh, horror short stories, not only Lovecraft, but uh, we read different authors. 
and uh, even novels and discuss them. So um, I would like to, to ask you, because you started as an English literary scholar, mm -hmm. and uh, did you start uh, from the beginnings of your career? Were you working with horror and uh, mm -hmm. which uh, areas of horror uh, do you have expertise in literature? That's true. Most of my work previously was on literature. And then I did more and more on other media, uh, mainly films. But my interest was always horror. I never really cared about the medium. Um, and I do realize that different media have different affordances, like I was talking about in the, in the, the different ways of it. You, you approach them differently, you know, analytically. Uh, but it's it's horror and recreational fear that really interests me, getting to the bottom of this paradox. Um, but most of my training has been on literature, American literature especially. Uh, just a, a common question we have uh, to our guests, uh, because we're always hunting for recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, which are your favorite? Uh, I, I think uh, you mentioned that your favorite movie, I think it was with uh, in Star Talk, that your favorite movie is uh, Halloween. My yeah, friend? but I changed. It's true that I said that, but I, you know, I give different answers every every time I'm asked. Which um, is your favorite movie today? Or today, movie? today it's In the Mouth of Madness. Um, and that is also a movie by uh, John Carpenter but it's strangely overlooked. And it, in my book, it's maybe the best Lovecraft adaptation, even though it's not based on a Lovecraft text, but it's really set in a Lovecraftian universe. And I, uh, so I want to point to that also because it's one that meant a lot to me when I had just as a teenager discovered uh, horror uh, in the mouth of madness. I think it's from 1994, maybe 1995. It's really good. And what about the uh, literature book? What, uh, which would be, would you say is your favorite? Oh, you did mention The Shining. Yeah, anything by Stephen King. Um, but I also, also I recently read a book called The Fisherman by John Langan, L-A-N-G-A, ah, you know? Yeah, uh, we read it in the circle. And we had the... Uh, we had Langan here. Uh, Langan here, right? He was, he was our yes. guest too, yeah. Wow. We have la creme de la creme. <laughs> I'm kind of star. I'm starstruck by being in the same virtual room as John Langan was in. That's just, that's just very important cool. people. Just uh, the, the the best of the best. VIP. I said, yeah. Right. Yes, oh, that's yes. cool. No, I thought that was really. Yeah. I, the, I, mm. Yeah, that's a very very good book. But I, I I also want to say that you are in the same virtual room as Lair Baron. Have you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah the ceremonies I read just recently. That was yes. really good. Yeah, yeah. Love him. Same here. The same virtual room. That's that's a nice way to put it. <laughs> Virtuality has become uh, very important. The new, the new reality. This is our new reality. <laughs> the new reality. Actually, when, when I read, uh, when you posted about the apex of fear, and uh, I couldn't help myself thinking, like, this is the perfect premise for a dystopian movie. It's yes. like an AI that uh, reads your, your, how do you say, like your physical uh, reactions and then creates a world of nightmare that adapts to you and uh, it goes crazy. And then uh, instead of looking for your fear sweet spot, it goes for the kill. It goes for uh, your worst uh, nightmare. It uh, already exists. It does? Yeah. I as can... a dystopian movie or as a real? Which one uh, is it? Uh, I, I have no mouth and I must scream. Aha, uh -huh, I haven't watched that. Uh, movie. Harlan Ellison, I think. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a classic yes. story. Yeah. That's uh, really a classic. Love it. And it's mm. terrifying. That's, that's a very painful read. There's also a Black Mirror episode called Playtest, which is also about something like what we're hoping to develop. So I'm, I'm, you know, maybe you think today it was fun to have me as a guest, but maybe five years from now when we're all being killed by 
this AI that got loose from the recreational fear lab back in 2022, you you might think differently. And if so, I apologize in advance. Yeah, this can become a part of the footage uh, mm -hmm. to analyze this uh, this event. But uh, mm -hmm. it's it's nice to be a part of history. You never know. Yes, true. Uh, there's something that uh, I would I would love for you to to talk about because I find it fascinating, um, and it's about disgust and mm. uh, and fear, um, and how uh, disgust uh, or the reaction we have of disgust uh, it's uh, evolutionarily adaptation. Uh, say how do you say adaptive? Mm -hmm. how it has helped us survive and how it transfers to horror for mm -hmm. example grave digging zombies mm -hmm. etc mm -hmm. yeah that's true so so there are these so-called basic emotions that are universal and that we all have and that have a very powerful kind of biological foundation and that have and continue to serve uh, important adaptive functions, functions in terms of keeping us alive, keeping us safe. Uh, fear is one such emotion. It compels us to avoid dangerous things. Anxiety is closely related to fear, um, the kind of fearful sensation that we associate with a more kind of abstract or distant threat. And then you have disgust, um, which itself breaks down into two kinds of disgust. So you have pathogen disgust and moral disgust. And pathogen disgust is what you feel if you, you know, smell something bad, you know, a toilet that's clogged or meat that's gone bad. Uh, that's pathogen disgust. And that's a response to protect the body from, from uh, contagion. If somebody coughs at you, uh, you'll feel, probably you'll feel it combination actually of pathogen and moral disgust because moral disgust is a response to norm violations people uh, violating norms you know somebody robbing a nice old lady or uh, making a kid cry just for the pleasure of it or uh, any other norm violation that you can think of and i think both kinds of disgust which feel the same are probably one evolved on top of the other you know final phylogenetically speaking uh, in terms of our species history uh, but they feel the same and they have the same kind of facial expression like a, you push out the tongue and scrunch your face together to block off any nasty odors and, and push out whatever substance might be offending you uh, but horror plays on both i think um, there will be elements in most horror that evoke pathogen disgust so nasty things rotting things oozing slimy sick things uh, even you know we did a study recently where we uh, we did an analysis of the voice of demon possessed reagan in the exorcist to figure out what is what are the acoustic qualities of her voice once she becomes evil and possessed and actually the the evil evil demonic voice has a lot of cues of, of uh, disease it sounds like the voice of somebody who is sick who has a contagious disease and it's interesting there is that kind of conflating of you know disease and morality morality shouldn't have anything to do with the disease but um but still it, it kind of mixes well together in people's minds so it made sense for the filmmakers to to equip evil reagan with a diseased sounding voice uh so plenty of disease cues and horror also plenty of um, um plenty of moral disgust you know that the, the antagonist doing evil things or whatever manifestation of evil is in focus. Um, something like Night of the Living Dead is maybe the zombies or what the ghouls are designed to evoke uh, pathogen disgust. The moral disgust is what we feel that, you know, Harry or those, uh, the posse that shoot the main character. Um, so, uh, so, yeah. Uh, now I recall, I think in one uh, uh, podcast where you were a guest, uh, you mentioned also, uh, you talked about the uncanny valley. Mm -hmm. Now that uh, we're talking about uh, zombies, why they, they frighten us. Uh, 
mm-hmm. and it's a very interesting concept because it's not a, it doesn't apply just to to horror. Uh, could you please uh, explain it because uh, I think you would be better at doing it. <laughs> yeah, so the uncanny valley is this idea that really goes back to 1970. So it, it's an old idea. It's 50 years old. A Japanese roboticist was interested in what would happen when robots became more human-like. And so he had this idea that the more human-like a robot, he made this graph, uh, and he thought the more human-like a robot becomes, the more positive our emotional response becomes. But only up until a certain point where the robot becomes very human-like, too human-like, and the emotional response goes down kind of into a valley of negative emotion. And then once the robot is indistinguishable from a human, the, the, the emotional response goes up again because we can't tell that it's a robot. But any kind of humanoid creature that looks like a human but is clearly not tends to unsettle us and disturb us. And uh, the, the roboticist who proposed this idea invoked some obsolete Freudian notions uh, to explain it. Uh, But the interesting thing is that the Uncanny Valley has since been found in many different domains. For example, it's something that's uh, being taken very seriously by CGI people in Hollywood when they create, you know, computer generated imagery of uh, human like characters. And so they tend to either try to make the CGI characters extremely photorealistic or very kind of cartoonish like in Pixar movies, you know, the human characters will have huge eyes and they're very obviously, you know, not human, but uh, comic representations. But, But another interesting thing, apart from the fact that this has been found to be the case, that we do have this negative response to human life, um, creatures or humans who are very far from a kind of species norm. So people who look strange, people who are asymmetrical or, you know, Michael Jackson in his, in his later life, uh, a person with whom there is something wrong, we tend to feel a kind of um, disturbance. Uh, But it's not just people. The the same effect has been found in macaques. So, um, so other primates also respond negatively to the uncanny valley. So some scientists constructed these photoshopped images of of macaque monkeys, um, basically macaque zombies, and showed them to to the monkeys, who then started yelling and looking away. And so that suggests that something very primitive in primate psychology that makes us keep our distance to a member of our own species who with whom there is something wrong. Maybe somebody who is infected with parasites. Um, it's not a very moral thing to do, you know, keep a distance to people who look different than the norm, but it seems to be built into our, into our biology too, maybe as a kind of disease protection mechanism. Some people talk about the behavioral immune system, that we, we act in certain ways to, to protect ourselves from infection. And maybe the uncanny valley is a result of the behavioral immune system or, you know, a, a, a version of pathogen disgust and obviously relevant for horror. Yeah. I think that maybe from that uh, that aversion is maybe the reason why most uh, um, possessed or uh, horror movies of dolls uh, mm. what, that they're based on, because uh, I don't know, most of them, the, the doll tends to be very, real uh, how do you say realistic or at least tries to to look realistic no mm-hmm. I like the Annabelle movies which I thought were dumb but also entertaining but evil dolls yes that certainly is a it's a staple of horror that we can we can make sense of with the uncanny valley um, framework yeah. um, I had the Oh, I had a lot of questions, but I don't know. Um, maybe a question that is not that relevant to me, but that I found very interesting. You mentioned also uh, how important can be for, uh, for example, kids 
to be mm. uh, exposed uh, to horror mm. in uh, maybe not uh, starting with uh, paranormal activity, but uh, like to have a start. And then uh, you mentioned some uh, movies uh, mm. that uh, all these animations like Hotel Transylvania and uh, et cetera. Uh, do you know if there are studies like, do these movies, uh, especially these animated horror movies, The Nightmare Before Christmas, etc., that are targeted for kids, do they get uh, to scare the kids? Or is it know. just a way for them to to make them get used to those images of what we usually use for horror films? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I do. First of all, I do think it's important that we don't try to shield kids from any kind of scary entertainment, not just because they're naturally drawn to it, but because I think that fear of vaccine is truly important. And I think most parents have an intuition that that's the case because parents love to scare their kids, uh, not just because they have you know subconscious resentment toward the kids, but they actually derive pleasure from you know, predator-prey uh, interaction, like playful games where they hunt the child. Um, and I think it's also a mistake to shield the kid from, it, from scary stories and scary movies, but they should be age appropriate. Um, but I don't know, we, th there is a book that came out earlier this year called Horror Movies for Children by Catherine Lester, which is really good at kind of, identifying this formal and stylistic traits of horror movies for kids. What is it they do to, to not become too horrifying? We don't re really know anything about what happens inside the minds of those kids because it's very difficult to do empirical research that involves children. You have to get parental consent. It's something we're hoping in the lab to do much more of in the future. Also to test this idea of recreational fear as a kind of anxiety or stress vaccine. Oh, but at the moment, I don't know of any studies that speak to what you're asking about. Yeah, I don't have kids, so I have no idea. <laughs> but it was something that I just thought was interesting to know. Mm. Uh, I don't know if anyone uh, has another question or if there is something from Facebook. Um, there's uh, nothing online, but... I have a question. Have you looked into the reaction to fear of uh, someone with a pathological, um, like like a sociopath or um, psychopath? Have you had this test? No. Um, I think my friend and colleague, Colton Scrivener, the guy who works with Morbid Curiosity, he did some research on whether horror fans are kind of more psychopathic than non-horror fans because some people think so some people think that you have to be kind of unempathetic and sadistic and not care about other people's emotions to be interested in horror uh, but there is nothing in the research literature that points to that it's not something i have investigated myself either i think you know i think i, I think you have to be compassionate and empathetic to to really derive pleasure from horror because it's it's not just about the scary things it's also about the it's also about connecting with characters who are faced with scary things and feeling strong emotions for and with those characters. Um. Yes, because it's like um, when you see uh, serial killers um, series or TV shows or, or mm. movies, they usually don't react to things like that. Like they don't care, right? Because they don't have empathy. That's mm -hmm. the way they portray them. But yeah. I don't know if there's more investigation into that. I don't know either, no. You have, a, in uh, White Horror Seduces, you have an example of a woman who has, uh, I don't remember how you define it, but these people who biologically, uh, they, they do not feel fear. Uh, which not which doesn't make them uh, psychopaths or sociopaths. It's, it's, it's something completely different. But uh, yeah, like 
it's a little bit uh, re uh, related, no? I guess in a way, it is true that there are these very few people who have a very kind of local um, brain lesion or brain disorder. In this case, the woman you're alluding to, she has, I think, uh, calcification of the amygdala, yeah. a small structure in the brain that is responsible for many things, including uh, emotions like fear. And she's unable to feel fear. She doesn't know what a fearful facial expression looks like. Um, she is not scared by huge spiders or horror movies or monsters. And it's a little bit of a mystery how she has managed to stay alive because we need fear to protect us from yeah. danger. Uh, but she has. Uh, she's been mugged several times, I think, attacked by, by bad, bad guys. Um, but one of the ways in which researchers have been you know, exposed her to, to fearful stimuli has been to show her clips from horror movies and take her to a haunted attraction. Um, and she wasn't scared, but she was interested, which in itself is interesting. Yeah, yeah there's also the cases of uh, this type of uh, persons who have these damages. And for example, they tend to do extreme sports. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that lack of fear, they go to the extreme and uh, there has been cases where they actually die like rock climbing without rope mm. or or the sword uh, i wanted to go back to what stefan asked you about uh, your experience uh, being uh, working with horror if that has uh, uh, affect the way that horror uh, affects you um, and I'm thinking of, for example, Talamantes, because I think Talamantes, he's very, um, he has a very acute eye for horror literature. And uh, for him, he, he's very interested also in the form, uh, how uh, works are written. So um, you mentioned uh, that uh, horror, it's, uh, strongly about uh, uh, causing fear, but uh, when we enter or approach uh, a horror film or a horror uh, book and try to see the craftsmanship behind it, mm -hmm. it, it can uh, create a distance that uh, sabotages uh, that. And maybe this is a question both to you and, for example, Talamantes, who I have noticed in, in the group discussions that uh, there has been some times where you, uh, you, you see the book has uh, not the craftsmanship that you expected. If that uh, is also something that you guys uh, experience, if uh, looking at the form, if it uh, affects the way uh, you feel the fear in these uh, works. I think it does. I mean, form, it's, it, it's the whole thing, right? I mean, the, the whole separation between form and content in a sense doesn't make sense. Um, and I certainly respond strongly to, to formal qualities. Even, you know, the first time I read a horror novel or a horror story, I just read it and enjoy it, or, you know, the opposite if it's bad. And if I want to analyze it and, and create an interpretation, I'll reread it may maybe several times. And I'm reading a novel right now that's causing me a good deal of anguish because I, I don't think it's very good. And I really like the author. At least I liked two of his books. And then I read another one that disappointed me. And then there is this one. And it's, it's throwing me into an abyss of existential despair because what do I do? Do I throw aside the book in the middle? Do I have an obligation to finish it? On the other hand, who knows if I die next week, should I be wasting my remaining nights in a book that's not very good? Um, it's a big problem for me. But I think that the, the, the flaw with that book is, is it's mainly form. It's also depiction of characters and impossible dialogue and um, so form is important uh, in most cases I don't think you're unless it's in experimental fiction you're supposed to pay attention to form but somebody like Stephen King writes in such a way that form is supposed to be transparent 
uh, he claims. That's not always the case. I mean, he can put together a really nice phrase that you can go back and read and reread just for the pleasure of, of the syntax or whatever, the words, the sounds, so on. Morgan, you have uh, raised your hand. Well, yeah, I have a question from the from Facebook, but I don't know if Talamante wants to add something first. Yeah, just uh, a little bit. Uh, I agree with Matias 100%. For example, yesterday we were talking about, short, about a short story by Chuck Palagniuk. And if you are familiar with his, his way of writing, he has this scatological way of describing things, but also he writes really, really well. So the form of his books and his short stories are basically great in form. But at the same time, he's writing about all these shocking things that you can you can help but feel the the pain basically about his writing and that's that's very few authors can do that yeah well uh, yeah we were discussing uh, guts last night that's mm. why yeah, I thought so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Talamantu doesn't like mm. those topics, but it was really fun. So the, the question we have from the public is, Jesus Humano says, in your research, have you found a lot of people that feel peace and relaxation through the scary movies? What, ca what category will these individuals fit in? Mm, good, good question. I don't, I don't know. I don't think we have... Um, because most of that empirical research we're doing, you know, involving real, real people in the real world, that has been at the haunted attraction. Um, and people are not peaceful. They're running around, they're being chased by a guy with a chainsaw and zombies and ghosts and things. Um, I don't know. It's, it's interesting because there is a kind of contrast between the peacefulness that you may maybe it's after having watched the movie. I'm not sure that you feel kind of at ease at ease with yourself and relieved that you made it. And, um, it could be the case for some dark copers. I imagine that that there is that kind of feeling of homeostasis, feeling that your system is finally in balance and um, you had a good experience with high intensity of emotion. I'm not. I'm not sure. It's a good question. Or maybe. Um... They can be distracted, like, like the one you put in a picture that was holding the girl and she, mm -hmm. he was smiling. Because mm -hmm. it's like usual to go to a scary movie with a girl to get a hug or something, mm -hmm. right? So yep. maybe if you're not actually thinking of that and you're distracted, like you said before, maybe you could be at peace mm -hmm. or, or happy. Mm -hmm. But going back to literature, like um, unless you are in a literary circle like this or something, you lose a lot of the social aspects, no, of uh, of the horror experience. That's true. Like I think the, that's mm -hmm. like the snuggle effect, for example. Mm -hmm. It's a bit hard if you are reading especially if one reads faster than the other one. Yeah, that's true. And in a way, I think reading a text is artificial in a sense, because storytelling for tens of thousands of years has been a, a, a social experience. You know, our ancestors told each other stories. Um, they also probably told themselves stories in their minds. Uh, and certainly they did when they were sleeping, and we still do. But I personally, there is a, a, a special pleasure and enjoyment in the solitary experience of being imaginatively absorbed in a text. Uh, for example, I always read for 20, 30 minutes before I sleep. And I love just going back to that, whatever world I'm currently uh, inhabiting. Uh, and it's not a social experience. So there is not the pleasure of you know, responding together with people and responding to other people's responses to a movie. 
uh, but it's a different, it's a more intimate, more in one in one sense, a more for me at least fulfilling experience. Yeah. I mean, if yeah, I had to choose, yeah, if I had to choose, if I had to choose a world in which there was only one horror medium, I would choose to keep uh, literature, and the rest could go. Mm. If I had to choose, happily, I don't. Maybe my AI will do it for me. The evil AI. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to call it? Apex or? Uh, the project. Is I don't know what you said. Pennywise, no. Yeah, the yeah the Pennywise algorithm, PA. Yeah, that's true. So there you have it, folks. Mm -hmm. The Pennywise algorithm, 2022. In case you thought 2020 and 2021 were bad years. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to, uh, we have a little bit of time left, uh, very little, because uh, uh, in Denmark, it's uh, almost midnight. Uh, but uh, I don't know if anyone uh, has some uh, final comments, words, recommendations. Talamantes? Yeah, uh, speaking about medium, uh, you said about literature, but we also talk a little bit about video games. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see an opportunity for this kind of algorithms to tailor the experience in video games to the person that is, to the gamer that is playing uh, at that moment? Maybe mm -hmm. if I if I have a, like a VR, VR, maybe if I go into the game, my experience will be different than yours or Gabby's or Morgan's. Yep, that's exactly what we're hoping to do. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I just want to thank you again for this excellent talk. And also, um, I'm going to uh, keep thinking about that game that you are making, like it's like an endless nightmare, right? Because it only gets worse and worse according to your uh, fears. So, And you uh, chose well, to have it. Yes, exactly. I mean, you can only disconnect whatever, whenever you want, but how many people will keep on going? I don't know. It, it's yeah. going to be very interesting. Yep. Yeah. Famous last words. <laughs> no, is it is it still very sunny here? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, very for much, you guys. Matthias. And thank you yeah. to Matthias for the excellent presentation. Thanks so much, all of you. Excellent, uh, excellent company to be in. I'm, normally, I don't enjoy Zoom, but now I'm really grateful for Zoom so that we could do this thing that we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. And I really enjoyed the. The discussion and the questions and the dialogue and the and the and, and the good virtual atmosphere and awesome to be in this in this place. So thanks, thanks for inviting me. Yes, thank you, Matthias. This was a conversation long due. We have been mm -hmm. talking about it for very long, mm -hmm. and uh, it was my fault that uh, it was uh, a bit delayed, but uh, but. It, it maybe it needed to happen in uh, in the wake of the apex uh, pennywise uh, ai yeah. experiment yes. but uh, thank you very much uh, and thank you guys for joining us and uh, thank you for those who watch on facebook and uh, you know that the, the video will be staying in uh, the circulo group so check it out and uh, that's it folks Thank you for today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Who turns it off? <laughs> <laughs>